good afternoon to one and all today now we will begin the day two third session i am very happy to introduce today's speaker dr krishna chaitanya he is a senior member ieee he received his btech degree in electronics and communication engineering from pondicherry engineering college pondicherry india in 2005 MS degree in mobile communication from Telecom Paris Institute Eurocom Sofia Antipolis France in 2009 and PhD degree in radio communications from Conservatory National Arts E Materials Paris France in 2016 from 2010 to 2011 he was a project officer with IIT Madras Chennai India from 2011 to 2012 he was an electronics engineer with the institute of electronics micro electronics and nanotechnology france from 2016 to 2017 he held a post doctoral position with the national institute of applied sciences rennes france in 2000 Easy. In 2018, he joined a coal central school. In 2018 he joined Ecole Central School of Engineering Hyderabad India as an assistant professor. He has authored technical papers in 9 international conferences and 5 international journal articles and holds an international patent. He was involved in few European and French research projects involving broadcasting systems and PMR systems. His research interest includes digital signal processing and wireless communication for 5G and beyond with a special focus on receiver synchronization channel estimation and equalization post OFDM waveforms and RF impairment mitigation He was a recipient of Sales French Minister Ministry of External Affairs scholarship in 2007 He is also a member of Institution of Engineers India. With this brief introduction, we welcome you, sir. Please uh, take over the session, sir. Okay, thank you very much for this wonderful introduction. So, um, and so we can keep the video. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Yeah. Okay, so let me share the screen. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So, for first of all, uh, I would convey my heartfelt thanks for the organizers for giving me an op op opportunity to have a talk on this, uh, improving energy efficiency in modern day communication systems. So, this uh, energy efficiency uh, becomes an issue when when we are dealing with high power amplifiers, uh, leading to A, either a very poor RRF uh, efficiency utilization or very high uh, wastage of uh, power or leading to a very bad nonlinear effects okay so we'll try try to see in this uh, session so some aspects related to that so the motivation comes from uh, green communications because uh, 
we know that in uh, communications, energy uh, and uh, the bandwidth, they are the two most important resources. Uh, okay, bandwidth, I may try to keep on increasing it in one way or other, but when it comes to the energy, energy, be it energy consumption or, uh, or uh, some uh, heat dissipation related to the high energy consumption, they have very serious implications. So, so improving uh, this energy efficiency is coming from this uh, uh, big goal of achieving green communications. So we try to see some important uh, motivation. Significant contribution to the global warming uh, comes from the IC, IC, ICT sector, means uh, be it uh, the IT, IT companies or the com communication uh, uh, technology related uh, industries we have, be it uh, cellular mobile communications or broad broadcasting uh, TV stations, whatever it is. So the contribution to the global warming is significant, means the heat dissipation is significant. So uh, this heat dissipation, it is directly related to the, the power consumption. Okay. So uh, related to the global warming impact due to the ICT, it was found uh, in a study in 2010 that around 2% of worldwide emission is because of ICT which is an alarming one and what they have predicted is is, is that uh, by next decade it will be uh, uh, the figure will be doubled okay and now some studies are going on to say that uh, this, this is this figure this number is going to be much more than what we have initially anticipated for so we need to reduce the uh, the contribution to global warming because of the, uh, the devices which we use in the ICT, be it uh, the transmitter or the receiver setup, okay? So all these things, they have put an increasing emphasis on green communications, making it one of the most important agenda by International uh, Telecommunication Union, which they, they wanted to achieve uh, by, by last year. Uh, to, to cut short the carbon emissions uh, per device by 30 percentage. Okay, so uh, now anybody, they, they want to pro propose any new scheme, any new technology, they have to always uh, keep uh, this emphasis on green communications in mind. So, um, okay, that was related to the energy, uh, the, like the heat dissipation. Now, okay, we come to the energy consumption. So this has become a key challenge in last few years because uh, the number of users uh, became uh, increased manifold. And also their devices, the extent, the, the uh, utility of uh, power by them also increased a lot. For example, like in a mobile uh, handset you're having previously, you use it only for voice calls, maybe to send SMSs. Today it is almost like uh, it is like your camera, your diary, uh, you can have your live uh, some, uh, live session with someone, you can try to send, uh, it means you can try to use it almost like a kind of mini computer kind of thing. Okay, so definitely it requires uh, um, uh, to use a lot of computational capabilities, uh, consuming a lot of energy. And the ICT sector, it alone, it is responsible uh, for the worldwide consumption up to 10 percentage. So this is uh, also a sig significant amount. And the power consumption has a direct impact upon the battery life. Nobody wants to replace their battery uh, just very off often. Okay, sometimes it is a bit hard also, uh, okay, you send some satellite or some remote base station you have, every time you cannot go and uh, change, change the battery. So, higher the consumption of the power, it is more detrimental to the battery lifespan. 
And okay, when we try to see that what is that that is draining the battery more, it has found that especially on the transmitter side, around 60% of the total power, it is being used only by one com component called power amplifier. Uh, it is the hottest component, means it contributes a lot to the, the heat uh, emission. It is one of the costliest components and also uh, like uh, one of the components which uh, uh, take a uh, lot of uh, power consumption, arguably the largest component. Okay, so we keep that aside and then we try to see that why, why we are facing much serious issues with this power amplifier. To do that, uh, we need to come back and to understand that uh, what our modern day communications is based upon. It is based upon modulation schemes uh, that, are, uh, that utilize multiple carriers ra rather than a single carrier. So in the earlier days, the digital communication, it was based on single carrier modulation. But if we manage to reduce the symbol duration, we can increase the bitrate of, of a transmission system. There is a power outage at my side, so I, I hope that it is still this link is not gone. Can somebody confirm that? Yes, sir. Visible, sir. Fine. Okay, fine. Yeah. So, so uh, this is one one end. I can try to re reduce my symbol duration. But on the other end, between the transmitter and receiver, we have this channel, and we know that what issues channel can create because of this multipath propagation. We have. We have issues like intersymbol interference, means uh, things coming because of fading. So to combat these uh, multipath fading effects, we have to opt for multi-carrier modulation. So we switch it from single carrier to multi-carrier. So okay, one one problem we try to solve. So we try to combat well this uh, multipath uh, fading thing, and then we try to see what things that come up with this choice. So, to, to, uh, to understand what a multi-carrier uh, modulation scheme is, that essentially, the existing band, what we try to do, we try to slice it into several sub-bands. We try to make sure that these sub-bands sub are sliced, means this whole band is sliced in such a way that is the width of the subband um, has more or less a flat fading kind of thing or a very mild selective fading. Okay. And, and also uh, to, to avoid uh, the interchannel uh, interference means between these subbands, we try to uh, choose the subbands in such a way that they are orthogonal to each each other. Means uh, yeah, they give uh, the spectrum overlap, but uh, mean they, they can overlap, but the interference uh, will not be caused. Okay, means we try to either minimize so overlap or that overlap occurs at a, at a, like uh, where the impact is very very meager. Okay, so today almost all modern day communication systems, especially mobile communication systems. They are based on MCM. You cannot do away with uh, multi-carrier modulation. Maybe for a short-range uh, communication, maybe you may, uh, where uh, you have to serve a very less number of uh, new users, you have some line of sight communication, maybe, maybe you can opt for a uh, single car car carrier communication, single carrier modulation scheme. But uh, for majority, for a vast majority, we are using multi-carrier schemes. So here is a brief overview of OFDM. I presume that you all know, like uh, with the modulation scheme, what we have. So I have an I-50 I have, and then um, 
And so to deal with the IISI, I add some cyclic prefix. So I send it to channel. I try to do exactly the opposite thing at the receiver and then do some equalization to, to remove the channel uh, channel uh, impairments, okay? To get back my estimated message. And today, OFDM is a very dominant technology. So you can, you can see it, be it in Wi-Fi, uh, LTE, even in 5G also, or uh, in a broadcasting uh, scenario also. So OF, OFDM is a very dominant technology. And the advantages of uh, OFDM, uh, you, the, the signal generation is very easy. Simply, I have to use one IFFT operation. And the uh, equalization is also simple. I can go for a single tap uh, equalization. And it, it has got some robustness to the channel kind of conditions. But it is having some limitations. Um, so because of the cyclic pre prefix, so the spectral efficiency get decreased. And also, it is very sensitive to off offsets, be it a frequency or timing offsets, because it leads to the loss of orthogonality. But if I start working at a millimeter wave frequencies, even the phase offset also can be a very severe one, which I cannot ignore. Okay. But of all the limitations, there exists one particular limitation, which is very severe. That is the high PAPR. PAPR is nothing but the peak power to the average power. Means I take a ratio of these two. Okay, so that tells us how, how much fluctuations a given signal is having in a given interval. Okay, this high PAPR it has a very um, uh, direct impact upon the power consumption and thereby also on the uh, the heat emissions as well okay and another thing the rf impairments in communication systems so at this point of time just read 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 that uh, some issues related to the power amplifier okay later we go more deeper into it to that okay so the rf impairments in communication system will be extremely severe for a signal with high PAPR means uh, if it is a if it are a lot of fluctuations, then uh, the the impact is going to be very very severe, and it leads to a lot of in band and out of band distortions. We will see sub subsequently what all those uh, distortions. Okay. So related to the PAPR. So PAPR of a continuous time baseband signal uh, with a time period uh, T, it can be uh, defined as the identity given there. So I have my, my peak power here of the signal and also the mean power. Just notice that I'm trying to calculate it uh, symbol by symbol, okay, it's duration. I'm trying to calculate this peak over the symbol duration. The same, uh, likewise, the mean power also, I'm trying to calculate it over the symbol period. So it is a parameter of, of a signal, and it is related to crust factor, another para a parameter called crust factor. We may have had this crust factor. Interestingly, PAPR of a signal, it is a random variable. And uh, from this identity, identity it is a very much a, evident that it is a dimensionless quantity. Now comes an inter interesting thing. Every multi-carrier modulation system exhibit uh, this, uh, this property of uh, having high PAPR, which is a matter of very serious concern. So OFDM being a multi-carrier modulation scheme, it is having this high PAPR. Okay. So this is a link between, so we can see that the, the link between the issue with the power amplifier, the high power consumption with the power amplifier, and the need for the multi-carrier modulation schemes. But because of my choice, okay, they have, they have this property of high PAPR, 
this high PAPR means this is the power amplifier uh, nonlinearities, okay, some issues related to the power amplifier, they will have very serious impact on our online signal, okay. So now we can see the kind of connection between this multi carrier modulation schemes and the power amplifier. So, first we try to understand like why why any multi carrier modulation scheme should have high PAPR. It is because that the transmitted signal it is nothing but sum of independent signals over the different subcarriers and they all have the same. PDF. When when uh, the number of subcarriers is sufficiently large, then you all know know that I can apply central limit theorem. So central limit theorem means uh, so these uh, independent signals. So, so this collection of these independent uh, signals they, they behave uh, uh, like uh, following Gaussian distribution. So. So Gaussian distribution means we know that uh, the tails of Gaussian distribution. So if I try to see the amplitude of my, my signal, so the Gaussian distribution it can go it, it can vary from zero to infinity. So it means ideally mathematically, I may I may have some peak which is almost uh, uh, close to infinity. I mean very uh, large peak. It's because of this Gaussian uh, nature of my signals and today we want to have like okay large f50 sizes we are talking about like in broadcasting systems we can go up to 32k means uh, 32768 f50 size so you can think of like that uh, how severe this PAPR can be uh, in a broadcasting scenario where I want to go for like uh, uh, highest of empty size okay so i mean uh, like uh, so in my signals let's be like the real part and the imaginary part they will be following this gaussian one so the uh, the envelope it follows the rally distribution but the tail being it's like uh, I, I can have very high peaks so this is a typical illustration i try to give for a given symbol here I have taken some and another wave and, and, and another waveform, some multi, multi carrier waveform. You can see that. So in its symbol duration, the mean envelope it is around just like 0 0.15 volts. Whereas the peak, the peak envelope is 4.2 volts. So you can see the difference here. And, then, and when I try to calculate the PAPR, you can see that. It's very high. It's around 15.27 dB. So you can see how the average value is and how the peak band value is. You can see, and this is just an envelope here. Okay. So if I take a, like a square, okay, because it's, I'm taking the ratio of the power, so I'll be having like a much more much more difference between that, so leading to this figure. Somebody has posed some question. So can the panel members can just uh, yes, sir. repeat that question? Yeah, their question is, uh, sir, in OFDMA model, why should take IFFT is to take as first because signal in time domain only? Have you understood question, sir? Shall I repeat once yes. again? Yes, yes, I have understood that question. Okay, okay, fine, fine. I can answer that, that question. Okay, fine. See, okay, so just once. You're, you're, you're you able to see my screen now? Yes, sir, I'm able to see, sir. Yeah, fine, okay. See, to, we deal with only time signals only. Okay, but with the OFDM, what I try to do is that by using this IFFT, Just using this IFFT, I'm making a change from spectral domain to temporal domain, I mean the time domain. Okay.
So this get lets. Okay. So because of this IFFT, whatever samples I'm getting it here, they are in the in that time domain. Okay. Okay. When you are doing your uh, simulation, like maybe in your computer or so, it may appear to you that they are in time domain also. But actually, they are not in the time domain. They are in the frequency domain because of this IFFT. And I can talk about the PAPR. PAPR can be calculated only with a time domain signal. Okay, only with the, my only if my signal is in the time domain. Okay, calculated. Let me repeat the PR is okay. So it may appear to you that okay, uh, maybe suppose if you are in the hard hardware, okay, you see that these are also samples you try to keep. You may try to keep them in the like as if that some sequence, but they are not in the time domain. This is a trick you are doing because in reality you have only time signals. There is nothing called visibly. There is nothing called frequency domain. If it is there, uh, you cannot view that one. The dimension is is only for you to contemplate, not to see it. You you you, you get my question. So, uh, I uh, the moment uh, okay. So to 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 uh, suppose if you want to work with something uh, in the frequency domain, so I can I can okay for some time sequence I can use some FFT. So whatever thing I'm getting at the output of the FFT there, so that I can view that all these, they are in the frequency domain. Even if, okay, you may see that, uh, okay, like a sequence kind of thing uh, in your, in whatever simulation you are doing, but uh, that one, it is in the frequency domain only. At, uh, actually, we work like as if that in, in practice, everything you do in time domain, like kind of thing only. So this will be in a sequential manner from, from serial to parallel. So there will be some serial to parallel conversion will be here. So here there will be some parallel to serial conversion will be here. So here there will be some sequence. Okay. So here also there, there will be some sequence. So it may be apparently it may look like, like that both are in time domain, but they are not. Okay, so is it fine? I, I, I hope that it is clear to you. If not, you may type the extra question, okay? Yes, sir, they responded okay. Yeah, yeah fine. Thank Good. you, sir. Yeah. So, so, so you can see that how severe this PAPR is. Okay, now let us have some insight about these power amplifiers. Okay, so until this point, we are okay. We are pretty sure that why why uh, the multi carrier modulation scheme is required for, for us, and uh, what are what are the advantage they are having? What the, what the, what particular severe disadvantage it is having? So this high PAPR thing, and now we try to see uh, from the high power amplifier perspective. Okay, so in any modern day communications, power amplifier is a very essential component because I have to boost up my signal so that it can travel for a very long distance. Okay, and as I said uh, earlier, so it is the one of the largest consume one one particular component which consumes very large power, very large power, and they are essential uh, essentially non-linear in nature because of uh, the transistors inside the power amplifier. Okay, you know that the, the conversion characteristics of transistor is non-linear. Okay, so, so the relationship between X and Y, it is not a linear relationship. If I, mean, between, if I take this as a some system, this behaves like a non-linear system. Okay, and, and this creates a lot of issues 
to, uh, when I want to receive my original message correctly at the receiver. And the point you see that here, my channel is here. So before I am transmitting my information to the receiver, because of this power amplifier nonlinearity, wantedly or unwantedly, I am introducing some distortions into my signal. Means, okay, the channel we know what what uh, impairments it will add to my to my uh, original message. Okay, you have this fading, this noise, AWG noise, all that. But even before that, the quality of my transmitted signal is um, uh, is uh, deteriorated badly. Okay. So, for the power amplifier, so you see that here, okay, so suppose that x of t and y, y of t, they are the input and output of the power amplifier. So, I can try to represent my signal in this fashion, so that it is having some amplitude and it is having some phase. Ideally speaking, y of t should be just some gain, some gain, some value, some number into rho into e power j theta, ideally speaking. But in reality, that is not the case. What happens is that for the amplitude part, you see here, so instead of rho into some scalar, you see that some function is coming into the picture. Means my output amplitude is some function of the input amplitude. Likewise, the output phase also means this is supposed to, the phase is supposed to be same. Okay, only the ampli amplitude gain should be there, not the, not any change to my phase. But some, some change happens to my phase also. And that it is again a function to my amplitude. This I refer as amplitude to amplitude conversion, AM, AM conversion. And this one, this function, I represent it as I, I refer it as AM PM conversion. Okay, AM AM and AM PM. And if we see here the atypical uh, conversion characteristics, AM AM conversion conversion characteristics. So here in the x-axis, I'm having the uh, the input uh, amplitude, and in the y-axis, I'm having the output amplitude here. Okay, of my signal, which is nothing but the AM AM conversion. Ideally speaking, what I want to have until the saturation region, I want to amplify my, sig my signal with a scalar gain. Okay, so it should be some linear function. Beyond some sa sa saturation point, I don't want to amplify it uh, further because it is su su sufficient. So I want to have some saturation. Okay, so this green curve means this green one which you see it here. Uh, it is supposed to be the ideal behavior of a power amplifier. Okay. But in reality, what we see is this black curve. Okay. For, for a very small region here, the green and the black one behave more or less same, means which I have written as the red one here. So there you will see that uh, the power amplifier um it will be, it will behave like a linear system okay but the gain will be small because see for small values of rho uh means what suppose this is some uh, slope i have here so if my de delta x is small delta y also will be, will, will be small right so the gain what i will have it will be small okay so if uh but this one, uh, what is the slope it here? It will be given whenever you purchase a power amplifier, it will be given by the manufacturer. He refer to it as a small signal gain or the gain you will get when you operate it in the linear region. This I call it as the linear region of the power amplifier. Okay. And then beyond that, up to the saturation point, so it is the nonlinear region. It means I can try to see it uh, here, so here or, or here. So, uh, in the linear region, the efficiency will be very, very low. And, uh, 
and in the nonlinear region, as we operate uh, my power amplifier closer and closer to the saturation, the efficiency will be increasing. So, uh, keeping the the energy uh, constraints we have, it is very important for us to operate the power amplifier close to the saturation region. Okay, I can give a like a, an, an analogy. It is like that uh, you are running uh, your car in the first gear and, and you want to go from Hyderabad to some maybe some Vaijag or something like, like that. Yeah, if you have abandoned petrol with you, if you are the only guy who is running the car, yeah, maybe you can do it. But if there is uh, some limit to the resource you have, and if there are more number of users who want to use that, then Pressure will be upon you to 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 judiciously utilize the petrol that is given to you. Same thing, same thing we have it here. The energy which we have it is limited, so we don't want to waste it. Okay, so we, we want to operate it close to the saturation region here. But the problem is that see this is a nonlinear in this you can see that it is a nonlinear function. So nonlinear function means. So the relationship is a nonlinear, so it will have some nonlinear effect means the, the on, on, on my output signal. Okay. Typically, what we try to do, uh, we try to take some back off from the um, saturation region. So, uh, so that uh, we try to make sure, so for example, if I take some back off here, so how I calculate the input back off. I can calculate it for the output also. Okay, there is something called OBO output back off. For the input back off means this X, uh, this input signal, before I am feeding it to the power amplifier, I try to uh, multiply it with some IBO coefficient so that I make sure that the peak of the signal means, means the, the mean of the signal will be operating close to this point so that the peak of the signal uh, will not cross the saturation line. The moment it crosses it, uh, it undergoes irre irreparable damage. Okay, so the peaks are more, then I have to operate it more and more close to the linear region, thereby leading to very bad utilization of energy efficiency. Okay. So the goal for us is to operate close to the saturation region and we try to mitigate this non-gear effects, keeping in mind the green conditions. So suppose if a signal is having high PAPR here, so you see that I'm supposed to take some back off, some more back off I'm supposed to take off. So more back off means if the IPO number is more, then it means that I'm operating farther from the saturation region or closer to the linear region of my power amplifier. Okay. But if I manage to reduce the fluctuations, so then what I can do, then I can try to operate it close to the saturation region here. You see that here, none of the, uh, the values here of the signal, it fall beyond the saturation point. But whereas here, you see this peak, it is falling beyond the saturation region. So this peak, it will under undergo very bad nonlinear distortion. Okay. So this is what we wanted to do. So we wanted to uh, deal with uh, uh, the PAPR issue of my signal. So I try to reduce the PAPR of, of my signal. So then I can I can um, try to operate it close to the horizon. Or alternatively, I can do something. I can try to linearize this curve, means straighten up this curve before the saturation region. Okay, that we call it as a linearization. And then, yes, I may also try to do it. The moment uh, this curve becomes a straight line, it does not matter for me. It's okay for me. Uh, if I'm having a small IBO or a large IBO, all I have to take care is none of these values fall beyond the saturation voltage okay so these are the two broad uh, solutions we can uh, we can try to work with okay 
And then for the PPR, so to how bad the PPR is, okay, or, or how good PPR reduction we have achieved. To, to understand that, there is a metric, a popular or a convenient metric we have. It is the CCDF of the PPR. CCDF is nothing but the, the complementary CDF of my PPR since it is a random variable. So it gives the probability that my PPR of my signal, it is beyond some particular value. Okay, so, so what is the probability that it is greater than 10, 10 dB, greater than 15 dB, something like that. Okay, so actually this is a very convenient parameter to us. Uh, which will help us in understanding the sensitivity of the HPA nonlinearity whenever we feed a multi-carrier uh, signal into a system. Okay. So, what are the nonlinear effects which, which we face? In the out of band, we have something called spectral regrowth. So the spectral regrowth means that I just I can try to. I I, I have up to four thirty, right? Excuse me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, fine. So what? So suppose uh, here. So just suppose if this is your PSD. Okay, it will be some sync function. So if you see the spectrum for WFDM, but simply just for simplicity sake, I'm writing like this. So this is your PSD. This is your in-band. Okay. So this is the starting frequency here and the ending frequency there. Okay. So because of this power amplifier thing, what will happen is that so for the sync pulse you have my side side lobes will be, will be there they start increasing so you see that i see something like 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 that on this side also i see okay for all the side side lobes so i can see that some increase is happening there so this means so because my spectrum got increased here in some of the energy here it got spilled to here so i cannot so i cannot keep another user here so here it is the user one ideally i want to keep another another user closer to this but because of this i keep it this user some user some distance is user two. Likewise, user three also at some distance. See, I'm wasting here. So here, see this much I'm I'm I'm, I'm wasting here. Spectrum. We know that spectrum is a very costly thing, and I'm wasting the spectrum. Means I can I cannot afford so so more spectral gaps. So more spectral gaps I have. Less serve less users. And wastage of energy. It's from the in-band it is spilling out, 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 out there. So wastage of So it is coming from the spectral regrowth is coming because of the intermodulation products that are generated when a digital transmitter is attached to an analog transmission system. Which means this uh, power amplifier, it, it comes under the analog part of my transmission system. So it is coming because of these uh, IM products. Okay. So that can be viewed um, if, if you are doing some simulation, you can try to plot the power spectral density. If you are doing some experiment, you can try to check it uh, using a spectrum analyzer. Okay. 
and these are really undesirable for us so for the reasons which i have shown you earlier and the multi carrier signal they are more susceptible to the im distortion and can so and uh, can can have large spectral regrowth components when they pass through non linear or amplifier okay so this is what i try to show it to you okay so we wanted to bring this thing down and when it comes to the in band so we have seen that some of the energy here it got spilled over there so the power spectral din din density when i try to try to see it will not show you it will show you like okay with a good in in band spectrum how, how how it is there the distorted one also it will show the same but this thing you will see when you are trying to plot uh, uh, the constellation diagram so you will see that the constellation so it, it is spread it got tilted here you can see that so it got uh, shrunken also it it, it 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 may vary it may become a, a more uh, dispersed or shrunken okay and you can see that here the dim in between the two two constellation points uh, it is getting decreased it means it will have direct impact upon the pr at the receiver okay so i can try to see this de degradation in terms of um, evm also okay you can see that there's some phase uh, change also happens because the spectrum got uh, rotated here okay uh, normally we see these things uh if there is some doppler f effect or all that but without all of them you are seeing them just because of the poor amplifier okay so our idea is to deal with these things okay to to remove the in band and out of band distortions due to the poor amplifier and there are uh, like different models for the poor amplifier you have both uh, memoryless uh, models and memory models you have okay so in this session i will be dealing with the only the memoryless models but um, if anybody if they want to work with the memory models i can su su suggest you some resources to refer okay so i i can split the behavior of my power amplifier into two two aspects one is the memory and the nonlinearity and this nonlinearity i can try to model with some of the popular models one model is the soft envelope uh, limiter model we have this model helps us to understand the ideal behavior of a power amplifier how a power amplifier should behave so like the the black line you have here okay so for the black one here so you see that so up to the saturation point uh, i have a linear gain and beyond that i have saturation so we so wanted to achieve uh, this performance whenever we want to use a real power amplifier or some power amplifier model which we wanted to use some techniques where on overall behavior will be close to the scr and then i have uh, some model called rap model which is used for solid state power amplifiers so where i have some parameter here you can see that uh, uh there is no the ampm conversion here only the amplitude conversion is there and there is a parameter here so here you have this parameter p so uh, this parameter p i refer it as a knee factor and by varying the knee knee, knee factor i can i can uh, try to vary uh, i can try to model the intensity of the, or on the, of the severity of the nonlinearity of my ssp okay so if this p is a is a small number then it means uh, the power amplifier is very nonlinear if it is increasing the more and more it is uh, approaching towards infinity then a uh, rap model behaves more or less like an scr okay. and then uh, it is also known that i can model the power amplifier nonlinearity as an odd order polynomial So, so modeling a power amplifier uh, in this fashion, we refer it as a polynomial model. And then for, we have for the traveling wave tube amplifiers, I have Salle model, 
in the Salia model, I have both AM AM and AM PM conversions I have. Okay, so you, you can see that what are the, con con the amplitude, amplitude, and uh, amplitude phase conversions I'm having them here. Okay, so now, now we, we come to the actual mitigation of HPA nonlinear effects. So mitigating them means that I can have very good uh, energy efficiency. So as I mentioned earlier, there exist two broad categories uh, for mitigating the nonlinear effects of a power amplifier. <clears throat> they are the um, PAPR reduction and HPA nonlinearization. The first category of uh, solutions, uh, yeah, in them in that the the, the methods. The aim at reducing the PAPR of my input signal. Okay. And, and the second one, it deals more than the signal, it deals with the power amplifier. So I have to uh, try to create some time domain inverse to my power amplifier in order to achieve an overall uh, linear B behavior. Okay. So that we refer it as linearization of power amplifier. Okay, so these two are the two broad categories, PAPR reduction and the HPA linearization. Okay. We may loosely term these approaches as signal-based, because the PAPR reduction is a signal-based technique. Here, I, I focus more on the waveform, what I'm using. They try to reduce the PAPR for that one. And for the second approach, uh, it is more like a component based where I have to, I, I, I'm supposed to have a good understanding about the power, power amplifier also. In the first case, I don't bother about which power amplifier I'm using, okay, in the, in the first method, okay. So we can broadly term these approaches as signal based and component based approaches, okay. So PAPR production techniques. So uh, again, for the PAPR reduction techniques, there are several classifications of the PAPR reduction te techniques. Okay, I'm saying for the OFDM, but the other, the other waveforms also, we have a plethora of PAPR reduction techniques. And, and these techniques, again, I can classify them broadly into three categories. Okay? So they are the, uh, like the first cat Category, they are like the clip effect transformations. So where I try to introduce something like clipping kind of uh, effect. And the second cat category, they are probabilistic approaches. Where instead of directly re reducing the peaks, I try to reduce the the probability of occurrence of these peaks. And finally, I have another category called the block coding uh, techniques where I, I use some uh, coding, okay, so some coding uh, methods such as like read Mueller codes where I try to uh, reduce the, the PAPR of, of, of my signal, okay. So in this one, so I like to cover very few of them that like I try and be covering the tone reservation. Briefly, I will mention about the selected mapping. Simplest of all these approaches is clipping and filtering. Okay. So clipping and filtering means that what I try to do is that I try to uh, tol tolerate my, my signal as long as it is below a particular threshold. The moment it crosses the threshold, then I will be clipping it. I mean, it means I'll, I'll be, um, what I try to do is that I try to make sure that its amplitude will be constant. Phase, I, 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 it, 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 it remains same, okay? I will not uh, touch up to the phase, only the amplitude will be clipped, okay? As you see it here. But um, when uh, I'm doing only clipping, it means that what I'm doing, it means that uh, uh, I'm changing the signal in the time line. Uh, you can think of like time domain and frequency domain. They, they ex expresses the reality 
in two different dimensions, the same reality, but the perspective of understanding these realities, uh, I'm, I'm using the different dimensions. Okay? So if, if I make any change in the time domain, surely in frequency domain, some change is going to happen. I'm trying to reduce uh, the peaks in the time time domain and in the frequency domain, you will see that uh, the side lobes gets increased. So it's like spectral regrowth is happening. Okay, so I have to filter these extra uh, regrowth that has happened. So I must, I must do filtering after clipping. Okay, so clipping and filtering is the simplest technique. Okay, the simplest technique maybe the I can say the first PAPR reduction technique that came to our mind. Okay, and then there is a very popular uh, technique called tone preservation. Actually, this technique is in the standard as uh, as as well. It is being uh, proposed uh, in broadcasting standards, both in the European ones and the uh, American ones. Okay, so. For example, like the European uh, uh, second generation terrestrial TV, the DUBT2, and the American one, ATSC 3.0. So you can see the tone, tone reservation uh, is proposed. So in tone reservation, what actually I try, try, I try to do? Suppose I have some signal here. So this is the data signal, which I want to trans trans transmit to the receiver but it is having a high PAPR. So what I try to do, I try to add with some magic signal. This, this signal cancels the, the peaks of my data signal. Okay. So since it cancels that, I refer this C of T as a peak cancellation signal. Okay. Combinedly, means D of T plus C of T, but combinedly, if I see, if I try to, see that in the time domain definitely the peaks got reduced so my PPR got decreased this i try to transmit to the receiver and to 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 construct this peak cancellation signal in the frequency domain what do you try try to do i try to reserve some sub carriers you can refer them as tones as as well so i reserve some tones so in these reserve tones, I will not keep the data. You see that, so data here, it is in the blue color here. So I have not uh, kept it there, okay. In these reserved ones, I have kept, I'm, 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 I'm using them to build my C of T, okay. So what I can do, if I know what are these reserved locations at the receiver, simply I can puncture them. After the FFT operation at the receiver, I can simply puncture these locations and, uh, and adjust the remaining ones uh, or my data. Okay. So, so this is an, infra, an in, interesting technique with, with a very good uh, PAPR reduction performance. But the point is that uh, here, the objective of the tone reservation, uh, it is uh, a, a QCQP problem. So QCQP means okay. So I have the PAPR of the means the total PAPR also I have my X of T, which is nothing but D of T plus C of T. Okay, so this is the data part. So this is no known to me, this is unknown. This is I want to find it out, okay. So what I'm supposed to do, I'm so I'm, my aim is to find C of T such that the PAPR of X of T is uh, minimized. So when I try to see me uh, the, the numerator of the PAPR, you can see that it is the, with the infinity norm. I try to minimize over C of T, X of T. This you can see that C of T. OK. 
going to So this I can write it as minimization in the, the frequency domain, the vector tor of the C of T, okay? So I do the inverse Fourier transform, this form. No, I mean the, this, uh, this uh, D of T, so I have it, D of T plus The yes, the IFFT of this one. my data. So this is the IFFT thing. Okay, so IFT of my data plus F inverse of. Okay, so this is no known to me, but I have to play with uh, this one in order to uh, min minimize this overall. Okay, so this is, I, I refer that it is a quadratically constrained quadratic program. Okay. So, I mean, here I have given only the objective function I have given. So, so but uh, to, to, it's, uh, to, to, to get an analytical solution, so we have to treat it as QCQP and, and solve. But uh, in hardware implementation wise, solving it as QCQP, it is not possible because it requires a lot of uh, complexity. Okay. Okay, and, and then I have this technique called uh, selected uh, mapping. In selected mapping, what I try, try to do, I have my signal X. I will rotate the signal. Means rotate, rotate means I will multiply with some rotation vector here, means each, so in the frequency domain. So I can try to rotate my symbols, means I can multiply with uh, some other uh, uh, rotating uh, co coefficient means rotating coefficient means I try to change the phase okay so by I try to do that so when I do do that um, okay I can try 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 to have like my original signal as as it is without any rotation here and the second one is after the rotation so for the both these sequences these vectors I do the OFDM modulation means I have FT and then in the time domain, I compare the partial PAPI, means symbol by symbol, I try to compare that. And when I compare it, uh, I, I try to pick the one which is having the least PAPI, and that I will be sending it. Okay, so uh, if I am... Uh, Okay, so I have the so x I have so it is some vector in the frequency domain my input my input symbol vector by vector my input symbol vector so this I try to multiply with some rotation vector. So this is also a vector here. Okay, this theta is also a vector here. So if I do do it once, so it is the first first copy. So I can rotate it uh, with uh, some second vector sequence here. Okay, so so this set a second. Remember that this is a vector. Yeah. Okay. So likewise, I can have some. So some u, u, u sequences I have so I, I, I for all of them I calculate uh, their PAPR calculate the PAPR and compare them 
This is the first step we do. Second is select the one with the least PPI. Okay. Suppose among all these, suppose if this is good, okay. So this one I liked it because it has the least PPI. Then to the receiver, I will be sending this information that the second uh, rotation vector is good. Okay. So then it will be very easy. All these rotation sequences, they will be with the receiver also. So simply they will be derotating de it, simply multiplying with e power minus j theta, minus j theta 2. So I can get my original signal back. Okay. So, so I have to send this extra inf information this extra information we refer it as side in information to the receiver. Okay, so if I have U sequences, I have, so I'm supposed to send how, how many bits are required for, for that log U to the base 2. So that is log U is 2 bits. It, it means that I, I have to incur some rate loss. Okay, instead of sending my actual information, I am sending some side information. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in my previous work, okay, I have done some work related to both of that, but uh, on tone reservation. So we have worked at it for uh, the broadcasting scenario. So when it comes to the broadcasting scenario, there is one more constraint coming into the picture. The constraint is the power control for the tones, uh, means a power control over the PRTs. Suppose this is in the frequency domain, so in the spectrum. So the blue ones are the uh, reserved tones. Okay, I'm talking about the tone reservation solution. There, how much power I can allocate to them? Because we know that um, the power allocated to PRTs, further from the receiver point of view, it is a wastage of power. It has uh, no meaning, uh, means uh, no extra per purpose than uh, reducing the PAPR. Okay, so so we try to reduce uh, the usage of the powers for the pilots. For that, what what uh, the DVT two. Uh, they have put this constraint that the PRTs should not exceed more than 10 dB over the data tone power. So these are the red, red, red ones. These are all the data tones. Okay. So when I compare the power between them, it cannot be greater than 10 dB. Okay. So, so this, if I can try to put it up mathematically as a constraint, so I can put it in this way. Means uh, the peak power of my uh, of, of my uh, PRTs, it should be less than, and now uh, how, how much dB I want to have, so that I could try to put it in the linear scheme. And uh, so when it comes to the my data power, so this inequality uh, adds as a constraint in my QCQB problem. Okay. Then for the broadcasting in the industry, it has, um, they use one more interesting technique for the PAPR. They, they refer it as MER, modulation error ratio. It has been suggested by the ETSR okay? uh, to, to, to measure the quality of the transmitted signal. For the receiver signal, uh, for, the, for the quality of that one, we try to see it in terms of the BER. For the transmitter side, it is the MER. So the MER, I can try to define it in this way. So for example, I have some power amplifier here, so where X is the input and X hat is the output. So I can define it as the, 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 the mean energy of, of my sync signal to the mean error energy. Means the diff difference between in the input and the output. So ideally speaking, both are supposed to be seen. If I assume that the gain is normalized, so ideally speaking, this is supposed to be close to infinity. 
okay because the denominator becomes zero so high the higher the mer better the quality of my transmitted signal and then we try to do simulations for the db t2 it's for different modes for different FT sizes 2k meaning 2048 and 32k meaning 32768 subcarriers and the constellation we try to choose is 64 gram and then uh, different the pilot locations they are given so we have chosen some pp7 pilot pattern and there we have used the, the wrap model uh, with some p value 6 we have taken and also the power control that uh, power constraint we have taken the power control constraint as 10 10 db and we try try to see it so original one we see it here where, where the MER is not good. With the ideal solution means by, by solving it as a QCQP, I can see some improvement in terms of the MER. But interestingly, what I also see is that MER is independent of the FFT size. This is a very interesting observation. Because if I try to work with CCDF, CCDF, it increases with the FFT size, because the more number of uh, subcarriers I have, the more Gaussian uh, uh, the behavior of my subcarriers, the peaks uh, will, will, will be. So the CCD will be more and more. Okay, it's as if like the graph is moving more towards the right, uh, the right side. Whereas here in this case, it is neutral to the FFT size. So, so I can try to understand uh, the 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 quality of my signal, whatever its FFT size is. That that was a very interesting uh, observation which we have noted. Okay. And then we try to see the impact of the power control also. Okay. So this is the original uh, MER. After I mean after the power amplification, it is it is bad. Okay, so we wanted to have that uh, the the so so we wanted to have the M MER as large as as possible. If the MER is less than thirty two dB, it is considered as a total broadcast failure. Okay, so we wanted to have an M M MER minimum 34 db often in the end in the industry they have this 2, 2 db buffer they keep so wanted to ensure that uh, my signal at any point of time it has minimum 34 db mer okay so if there is no power constraint then yes uh, i am on, on one side i'm wasting a lot of my uh, power power what i have but i can have a very good P, um, PAPR reduction, meaning that I can have a very good improvement uh, with respect to the MER. You see the, pur the purple uh, line here. Okay, so I can see that. So if I try, try, try to see at uh, 66.4 dB, I can see e some improvement here. So where I can see that it is around uh, almost close to 4 dB imp improvement I'm seeing in terms of the MER. But as and when I try to keep this uh, constraint and more severe the constraint is means more severe means if uh, the, I cannot have more than 3 dB means uh, the power cannot be more than double than that of the data modes then you see that here the MER in, 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 in improvement is getting less and, 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 and less here and it is the it is the being summarized here okay so we see that already this uh, power constraint uh, on one side, it is uh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm gaining in terms of the energy wastage that is being uh, used for the reduction tones. But on the other hand, it is de de detrimental to the performance to, re re to reduce the PAPR. Okay, this is the first observation we had. Okay. And for the DBT2, it has suggested some iterative scheme. So what I try, try to do at each iteration, I try to build my, my uh, peak cancellation signal. And in the frequency domain, 
I can simply I try to see that how much the power is. So in the first I I, I, I iteration, so I have some values here, and it's trying to see it in the frequency domain. And the green one is the second iteration, yellow is the third, and subsequently blue is the last one. So the moment at least one of the tones, the moment they cross the A max means this A max which is related to the peak con constraint. The moment they reaches that, then I stop the all the algorithm. Okay. So the scheme it is proposed uh, both in the DBT2 or uh, AT80. ATAC, uh, like okay, you may try to go with this kind of scheme. Okay, the advantage is that you don't require any additional IFFT, but the problem is that see, we have seen that here, we have seen that more I use the power, if I try to use maximize uh, the usage of the power for the PRT, better my performance is. So, here, see, some power is left unused here, here in this case. So because of that, um, even though the, the specification it is saying that okay, you may use some power, I am not using that, and thereby leading to a suboptimal performance. Okay, so uh, keeping that in mind, we have proposed a new technique. So what we try to do is that uh, in the previous case here we tried to use a like a yeah, like a like a Dirac, so a Kronecker delta function in that time domain. I try to use. Okay, I try to use that. So that means like it's like a comb, like a spectrum. I will see in the frequency domain. So just I was use, using that. I tried to add it to my means wherever I have a big big peak. So So, so I have some signal here. So what I try to do, I have my my Kronecker delta function. So. Okay. So, sorry, this is a, I'm bad at uh, drawing. Okay, so. What you do, I will be shifting it. So I will be shif shifting it where my peak is, and then I try to can cancel. So if the peak is here, so I try to rotate it so that it will have a negative one, and then I try to can cancel it. And then for this one again, I will be shift shifting shifting it to this point, and I will be canceling this one. Okay, so I will have so finally uh, I will be having the PPR reduction here. So in time domain, if I have uh, like a chronicle delta function in the frequency domain, it will be like a comb kind of function, okay? So what we did is that uh, in, the, in the frequency domain, we have used like a comb kind of function, okay? Comb kind of fun function means that, uh, so each uh, the PRTs I, I have, so these PRTs, so I can think of it like a comb, and then every time I deal with only one single uh, edge of that comb. Means it is like a chronicle delta function, I'm using it in the frequency term. And they will have the, the all this, the, their amplitude will be complete. I mean, uh, uh, complete with respect to the power constraint that was given. Means all of them, they will have A max. Means I'm, I'm using complete power that is allocated to me. Okay, you, you, you can see it here. Okay. So that then it means that in the time domain I will be having a comb kind of uh, kernel function I will have. This kernel function I will be shifting it in the time time domain, and I try to see that uh, for for what given shift I mean for what phase I am having least PAPR. So my problem now it is simple. It is that just to find what is the phase, what is a good good phase. I have to shift. I have to make that change now to get the least PAPR okay. and by cal calculus we try to find out what is the expression for, for that phase to bring that shift and then we try to uh, you are uh, we, tra we try to first have that comb, comb signal then we go to the next scheme 
Okay, so I mean the 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 next uh, tone we have. Like for example, for example, in this case, I have uh, four reserved tones. I have for the first one. I I I, I use the complete uh, power I have, and so in the time domain, I'll be shifting it. Time domain I'm shifting it means in the frequency domain, uh, it gets rotated. Okay, the phase of this rotation will will happen for this one. Okay. So once I come construct that a sub a sub a signal, then I come for this one, this tone. I do the same for the time time domain. I will get again another comb signal, and again I will I will find the good phase to minimize the TAPR. Once I do that, I add this one to my first comb signal. Means I am I am working on individual car car individual carriers to reduce multiple peaks. Means in the time domain. I will fix that. Okay, I want uh, using this comb signal. I want to re reduce hundred peaks, two hundred peaks, or very small fifty peaks. So I take one carry carry one carrier and I aim to reduce multiple peaks in the time domain. So we, we named the scheme as ICMP. Okay. So the objective function of that when it is given to us here. So just those those peaks in the time domain we will take. And the corresponding, so when I try to shift it just at those locations only, I activate my, my comb signal. And just there, I try to simply change, find out the fees. Okay. So try to find out the fees uh, to, to, to get the PAPR reduction. And this scheme, we have shown that it is, its performance is really good. So the, the original one which was suggested by the DEBT2, we see that its performance is not that much good when I try to compare with the, the original uh, MER, means after the power amplifier, power amplification, it is very small uh, growth I see here, okay, in terms of the MER. But here this one, the, the blue one with the dots, this is the best performance, theoretically best performance we can get. But the complexity is very high. Practically, it is unimplementable. Okay. But in between the ones, what we have shown, even by by implementation, hardware implementation, that we can get close to that one. Where, but the complexity is a linear order complexity. With a linear order complexity, we are having a performance almost quasi optimal. We can see that here. So we can see that here uh, that when I try to re reduce 200 peaks, just uh, the difference uh, is only just, I mean, I try to see that uh, here, the, just the, the degradation, it is very, very small when I try to see with the QCQP. So, so this was a very interesting. So we see that the loss, the MER loss, Okay, or okay, if I try, try to see that with respect to here, okay, so when I try, try to see it at the 34 dB, means if I compare this point and uh, this point here, just if I draw a horizontal line, we see that the IDBO loss is very, very small. It is just 0 0.07 dB loss. So, so this was a very uh, interesting uh, finding by us. And, and, and uh, this has led us to, to publish uh, in a very good journal. So we had some transactions at Plexus, and we also pu pu published in the broadcasting uh, conference. So this work, okay. So this is related to the PAPR reductions where I have given like on one walk which I have done. And uh, we go for the lin lin linearization technique. Okay, so the power amplifier linearization means what I try to do is that I try to work on the power amplifier linearity. I try to improve it and make sure that uh, the power amplifier can be operated at a lower IBO. Lower IBO means, uh, please be noted that I'm operating close to the saturation region, means with a very good energy efficiency. So this also means that uh, lower power consumption and low cost. Why low cost? Because 
uh, if you want to if you want to um, work my power amplifier with uh, work with my power amplifier on the in the linear region uh, to to bear with all these big fluctuations it should have very high dynamic range high dynamic range means uh, uh, it will be very costly that's why power amplifier is a very costly component uh, in the, in a communication system Okay, suppose you are shelling a lot of money when you purchase a good phone. One reason is that uh, the power amplifier used in the equipment you have it is a very costly. Okay, so so I can I can achieve uh, 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 I can achieve reduction in the power consumption, but also in terms of the costs. Okay, so I, I can have some good cost cut also. And then, and and then that uh, okay, I can operate it close to the saturation region, so I have very good uh, RF amplification efficiency. And there are a lot of uh, linearization techniques. Among all linearization techniques, the most popular and the cost-effective one is digital predistortion. Okay. So, our amplifier is in the analog part. Next, just before the antenna, okay, after a power amplifier, just you will be sending the signal. So, it's, so there my information is in the form of a signal. Before up conversion, my information will be in the form of uh, just a sequence of numbers. Okay. When it is in the form of a signal, then to deal with it, to work on it, it will be really hard. Okay. So, to linearize uh, in the analog, uh, part of my communication system, it is a bit hard. Whereas to do the same near the baseband or the digital part, it is very easy because I have to deal with some numbers. Okay, so, so essentially this digital predistortion means I will be doing it before the up conversion. Okay, and this is one reason uh, why it is most cost effective. Okay, so I have to try to bring back the signal again into the base band, I do something, some signal processing I do to linearize as it, and again I go for the up conversion and sending the signal. Okay. So, uh, what is a DPD? A DPD is nothing but to apply time domain inverse characteristics of H of H H H P A before to the H H P A. Okay, so that uh, the linearly amplified signal can be produced at the output. Suppose uh, if, if I can model the power amplifier and the DPA system as mathematical functions, so I can try to write it in this way. So first I predistort my signal. So this is this function. Okay, this output I feed it into the amplifier. Since both are inverse to each other, they cancel out. And uh, I get uh, uh, y of t is equal to x of t into some li linear gain. Okay, so I mean here I am showing uh, uh, the non normalized one. Okay, I have, there is no gain here. Okay, I normalize the gain means the relationship is linear. Okay, and evidently uh, DPD requires a feedback because. Uh, only after the power amplification, I will know that what kind of uh, distortion my signal had. So I try to bring back the signal again into the baseband, okay, and to work on that one before sending it back. Okay, so so it is a feedback signal, and in most of the cases, uh, it is a non-convex optimization problem. Okay, in previous case we have seen okay in tone tone reservation. For convex pro problems, we have solutions, we have analytical solutions. But for hardware implementation, it's not feasible. If my problem itself is non-convex, or I don't know if it is either convex or not, I'm not sure about it, then at the first place, I don't even have a proper so so a solution there. So, so this uh, gives us the, the seriousness of the pro problem which we try to solve. This is the reason why DPD is a very high patent, highly patented. 
uh, very good DPT techniques you don't see in uh, in any scientific publication. They are highly patented by the companies, and almost every major company they want to work on on this DPT. Okay, so I can give a small like small anecdote like uh, uh, when I was pub when I was uh, publishing one paper at Finland. At, uh, at this, uh, so I had a chat with the 6G six, six research group there. So they were closely with the Nokia Bell Labs. Here, when they came to know that I work on this digital distortion, they told that uh, the Bell Labs people, they don't have a um, solution when there are more antennas. Like I talk about MIMO, my, my MIMO communication system. For e Before each antenna, I will be having a power amplifier. One power amplifier amplifying my signal itself, we see what bad things it is doing. So each power amplifier which introduces some different kind of non-linearity. And when I have to talk about a massive MIMO scenario, many of, yeah, so then my, my problem becomes more complicated. Okay. So they are working on that one. So they told that uh, this is the problem which we have not uh, found a solution yet. So you can see that if the 6G group, if they are working uh, very hard to find out a problem, you can see that how hot topic DPD is. Okay. So if the memory effects of my power amplifier, if they are neg negligible, then there is an interesting theorem called Bose gang theorem. Okay. So then my nonlinearity, I can think of it, suppose means this X, X of T, I fit it into some nonlinear system, I get the Y of T. So this Bose gang theorem says that uh, Y of T is nothing but X of T plus some di distortion term. Okay, so the linear term plus the distortion term. If I can subtract this uh, distortion term, I mean, uh, if it is for the DPD, then I can try to get back my original signal there. And so what I meant to see is that is So, I have my X of T here, I'm feeding to the power amplifier, I have my Y, y of T. So, this gang theorem says it is nothing but X of T plus uh, C of T. If I can find out what the C of T is, so that what I can try, try to do so that uh, yeah. So y of t minus x of t is cc of t. So this is plus, this is minus. I'm taking a negative feedback kind of thing. I'll getting the error e of t. If this e of t Okay, if I can do that, so this is plus here, this is minus, then what, what will happen? Here I will be, now, I will be sending to the power amplifier only x of t minus e of t. So we know that uh, y, of, y of t is nothing but, so y, y of t is nothing but x of t minus e of t means my, my linear term plus C of T. We know that C of T and E of T both are uh, like uh, both are seen, so so they get cancelled. Okay, so I'll be getting back my E of T. I mean, I'm talking about the the gain is normalized. Okay, so gain is normalized. So what I'm trying to do here. Here, 
I have replaced my X of T. I have some DPD system there. My power amplifier there. This DPD I have replaced with some add adder add here. Okay, so this is what uh, the bus game theorem is talking about. Okay. So uh, I have you have worked on that and we proposed uh, some uh, good good schemes. So I had uh, one paper which published in ISWCS IEEE conference in Finland. So where uh, it happened with the six six G research group. So published and recently, if one transactions was uh, published. I thought that uh, it will be too much if I go into the details also, so I'm not presenting it here. But if anybody is interested, you can uh, go and uh, you can refer them. Okay. And related to the the memory models, so you can try to have you can try to refer some resources where they talk about Volterra series. Okay. Where I model my power amplifier as a Volterra series. I have like generalized uh, polynomial, uh, generalized memory polynomials. Okay. Memory polynomial. Also, people work with the Weiner -Ham Hammerstein system. So I can model my HPA as a binary Hammerstein system, and then try to find out its uh, end products. Okay, these are all the HPA. HPA. Okay. Yeah. So I think uh, pretty much uh, I have concluded my presentation. So, so, for a better future, an energy efficient green communications is the need of the hour. Thereby, it is imp imperative to operate uh, the power amplifier at a higher efficiency in its nonlinear region by opting techniques to mitigate uh, its uh, nonlinear effects on the transmitted signal. And two broad cat categories are the PEPR reduction and HPA linearization. In the latter one, digital distortion is the most uh, interesting uh, technique which we a lot of people are doing. So if you have any questions, uh, yes, you can ask. I, 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 I hope that uh, you're able to follow this one. Any questions? Yeah, dear participants, if you have any questions, please ask the speaker. Sir, in high power amplifier, there is a, a trade off between uh, linearization and uh, efficiency. <laughs> yes, then, how do we choose the best uh, this one, sir, to meet so, the highest uh, performance? Yes, there is a um, there is obviously uh, a trade off between linearity and efficiency. Correct. So, what we have to do is that uh, we must uh, use both these techniques. If I, if I completely linearize my uh, power amplifier, that does not mean that uh, I have achieved good energy efficiency. Because if I don't reproduce the PAPR, then some of these peaks, they fall in the saturation region. So, so uh, to achieve a good trade-off between the linearization and uh, the efficiency, I must employ both these techniques. Whether these techniques, they can collaborate each other or there can be like two separate uh, techniques being used in the communication chain. And uh, in my work, uh, we have shown that uh, my subsequent work, soon I'm going to submit my paper to IC, uh, ICC. So um, we, we, we try to see that uh, combining them, 
in a collaborative fashion, PEPR reduction and the HP mineralization, it is more more uh, better than then employing them both in a non-collaborative manner. Thank you, sir. Thanks. I think uh, that uh, can, can concludes the presentation. So, thank you. Thank you very much for giving me this good opportunity. Sir, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and sharing your knowledge. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, and I have really enjoyed it because it was uh, not just one hour, so I can try to explain things. Uh, yes, sir. Using yes, this, uh, what uh, tablet I have, so I can try to scribble some notes to explain. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I stopped the recording. Yes. Uh, screen share. Thank you. Your participants' uh, attendance link will be shared. Please fill the attendance link. <laughs>